Richards. Good to see you. You made it through the snow. Woo! How many like the snow? Okay, all right. How many don't like snow? Okay, all right. Woo! We got a spirit filled one in the booth there. I like that. All right, well, you made it through and you overcame adversity. And that's what we're talking about today. How cool is that? Adversity. In fact, I bet you can't guess what our scripture is today by looking at the giant screen there. We're going to look at the Filipino church today. Y'all didn't get that. That's not Filipino. It's Philippians. But y'all are still sleepy. That's okay. I was talking to somebody this morning. I said, you ever have one of those days where you're razor sharp? And like, I mean, your, your thoughts are just firing and everything is going just right. Today's not one of those days for me. I was... <laughs> I was telling somebody about our motto for the church. It's four words, y'all, and I messed it up. I said, oh, yeah, man, love God, love God, you know, and it's love God, love people. It's close. There's nothing wrong with that, but, man, y'all are in for a treat today because I can't even get four words right. This is going to be awesome. Today is perfect to talk about adversity. If you do a quick Internet search, just type in adversity, you're going to see all these great memes come up and all these wonderful intellectual giants come up with things like this. They say, like, C.S. Lewis, I love that, and Albert Einstein, and LL Cool J? What? Really? Even LL Cool J comes up with a, a, a pithy comment on adversity and how to deal with it. And you hear, you see all these great, like, slogans, like, cheering you on, like, what doesn't kill me makes you stronger, right? No, that's not right. Look at this, adversity, that which does not kill me postpones the inevitable. It's okay. <laughs> That's adversity. Or this one here for all of my fishing and kayak ironic adversity. You chose kayaking over parasailing because you thought it would be safer. I love that. Do, do, do. Adversity. The fact that you made it here today means you overcome some adversity. I know we had even one person already fall today in, on the ice that's kind of hiding in the shadows there. You overcame adversity. And today we're going to look at some amazing things at what Paul has to say. If you were to pull out your smartphone and ask Siri, define adversity you might see something like this. Adversity, difficulties, misfortune, trouble, hardship, distress, suffering, affliction, sorrow, misery, tribulation. Wow, this is horrible stuff. Who wants adversity in their life? Let's be honest. Not one of us wake up in the morning and go, Lord, could I have a fresh heaping cup of adversity today? I mean, if you do, well, you're either really mature in your faith, like Paul was, or maybe you should go back to bed because that's, that's just not how we naturally think. Adversity is tough. I want to share a very painful, embarrassing story as we begin here of how I felt every single one of those things in blue down there. I had a chance to go see, yeah, you can put it up. I had a chance to go see my favorite band, Striper, the greatest band of all time. We, it's not even open for debate. And as we, as we look at, this is them in the 80s. Here's their stage show, and here's them in all their glam. <laughs> The drum set up there, and it was awesome. And, and all through the 80s, as I was struggling with my secular music career, and God was pulling my heart this way, and the world was pulling me another, and, and I wasn't sure what, what to do. And finally, God used a band like this as part of my testament. I won't share the whole thing. But he used him and the lead singer, Michael Sweet, to pull me out of my funk, out of my self-absorbed, indulgent, me-focused career. And I'm so glad he did, because 30 years later, they're still going. You can see them. Here they are on the left, I believe. It's a House of Blues recently. And then here, they tapped the lead singer to be the lead singer for Boston when their lead singer tragically died. And because he could hit the high notes, and he could play guitar, and he's just awesome. And he's the legend. And so, fast forward till just a couple years ago, my wife comes up to me, and she says, we have a surprise for you. We? Who's We? She says, I've been talking with your mom. <laughs> well, that right there could, you know, you don't know what's going on when the in-laws are talking and things like that. And I said, this is either going to be really awesome or not, <laughs> right, based on this. She said, we found out there is a fan excursion, the ultimate fan excursion, where you get to spend not one, not two, but three days with your heroes. Three full days. You get to eat with them. You get to have a private concert with just a handful of people in an acoustic setting, and then you get front row seats, early entrance. You get to bring all the items you want to sign. You get to hang out. You get to do a Bible study with them and have a devotional where they lead worship in a church service. And you get to know where their hotel is, and you can stalk them. I mean, it is just going to be an awesome, awesome time. And I said, man, that sounds incredible. I don't know if I can do that. Yes, you can. I said, you don't understand. When I get around somebody like that that I look up to and I get to meet like my hero, 
someone who's part of my testimony, who brought me to faith in Christ, I clam up. I get all, bleh, 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 bleh. I can't talk. I can't make a coherent thought. It's true. I, I become this raging introvert. So I said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go. And that day came, and I found the secret email they sent that tells you the secret location that they're going to be at. And you could go, and you can start with dinner. And you get to meet them. You have the, the, the Diet Cokes are flowing, and it is awesome. And you're right there with the band, and they'll sign anything you want. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversation. I said, you know what? I'm going to go early because I like to have my stuff together. And I'm going to have notes, and I'm going to find a table, and I'm going to write down every question I've ever wanted to ask, everything I've ever wanted to talk to this guy about. I can't wait. And then my daughter comes up and says, Dad, their favorite colors are yellow and black, right? I said, well, they kind of hate those colors now, but that's what made them popular. Yeah, yellow and black attack, and I'm going to make them a bracelet. And remember those rubber band bracelets that were real popular for a while? I said, oh, that's it, Marin. That will be the perfect icebreaker. Make that, and I'll give it to him. I'll say, man, my nine-year-old daughter made this for you. It's going to blow his mind. It's going to be the perfect. It'll help me fall back. If I forget everything else, I'll have that. So fast forward. Here you see a picture of Michael and his lovely wife, Lisa. And I get to this restaurant. It's downtown. It's next to a convention center, some fancy place. And I get there an hour early, and I get this corner table, and I have my notes. And I'm setting them up, and I'm getting ready to write all the things. I have an hour to prepare what I'm going to say to this guy. Or so I thought. And as I'm getting ready to pull my chair out and sit down, I look up. And in walks Lisa, his wife. And I said, oh, please, Lord, don't let that be. And two seconds later, in walks the great, the mighty, Michael, the archangel, sweet himself. He comes around the corner. And y'all, I didn't have an hour to prepare what to say. He walks right over to my table. And I just walk around, and Lisa's there first. I give her the most awkward hug. It was like this bizarre half-side hug. That I don't know what it was. It was so, it was just, I didn't know what to do. I was so weird. And Michael looked at me like, what is up with this guy? And I look at him, and in that moment, all the things I thought I was going to say just flew. I had nothing. And I went to shake his hand. He goes, hey, man, how you doing? He was so gracious, so humble, so kind. I look, and there on his wrist is the exact yellow and black bracelet that someone had already given him, and that was my one thing. I knew I could fall back to it. Here's my first words to Michael Sweet, the guy I've looked to for 25 years. I looked at his bracelet, and I froze. And I can't even remember. I just started saying things like, like bizarre words that didn't even relate to each other. I just started mumbling, and I said, bracelet, uh, uh, me too. Uh, daughter, you have one. <laughs> Hi. That was my first interaction. He was so great. He shook my hand and said, hey, how you doing, buddy? We hugged. I turned around. I grabbed my notes. And I left. I know, right? It felt awful. All those words, trauma, <laughs> disappointment, anxiety, everything you think of adversity, I felt all those all at once. I get my phone. I call Amy. I said, I just met Michael Sweet. That's great, baby. How'd it go? Horrible. Horrible. I feel terrible. I blew it. I had all this, and I just, it's like, I just, it, once I got thrown off and the, the table, my notes, it's adversity, and I just, I could, I'm coming home. She said, no, you're not. We paid for that excursion. You going. You, you, go, you and your mom, you, we, you, you're going to be, you got this. And she proceeded to talk me down off the ledge. And she started saying things like, man, this is your guy. This is your, it's part of your testimony. You're in the kingdom. You're in the ministry because of this guy's ministry. Go back in there. You can do this. You may die on this battlefield, but not today. You go and you go. And I mean, it was just like I wanted to smear on blue war paint and just go charge. And I ran back in there because of her pep talk. We overcame adversity, and we were able to take photos like this just minutes later. And this one right here where I said, can I thank my mom? Would you mind holding this sign for me? And he's like, absolutely, I would love to. And then I said, one thing I've been loving to do, I said, you know, I'm a former lead singer. I said, I still got my metal scream. I could hit them high notes. I said, can we do one together? He said, absolutely. <laughs> and we got to do that, y'all. But none of this would, oh, look, there's the bracelets. See, see, <laughs> see, look, no kidding. You know, I'm telling the truth. None of this would have happened if I caved and I crumpled in that adverse moment. Everything I was looking forward to just, just, just had I not had a good conversation with someone, I'm going somewhere spiritual with this, y'all, this would have not happened. How do you handle adversity? One of the things I love about Paul, Paul 
gets it. The more I study him, the more I study how he reacted when he had wave after wave of bad stuff happen to him, the more I admire him, the more I love this guy. I can't, I, I can't describe enough how much respect I have. When I'm reading through like Corinthians, and he says this right here, therefore, that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecuted difficulties. For when I'm weak, I'm strong. Who thinks like this? That is the mature Christian mindset on full display. When bad stuff comes your way, and it will. When struggles come your way, and it will. When that phone call comes in the middle of the night that you don't want, and it will. How do you handle it? What do you do with this kind of adversity? I love it. Paul says, I delight in it. I, you know what that means? That literally means I take pleasure. I think well of adversity. In Philippians, we're going to read in just a minute, Philippians is so full of him facing adversity after adversity, and he thinks well of it. It is incredible. I can't wait to digest this. So what we're going to do, it's a lot of scripture. We're not going to read the whole thing at one time, because you'll forget half of it by the time we finish. It's that long. So we're going to go verse by verse today. A little expository exegesis for us, one by one. So open your Bibles to Philippians 1, or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to use the NLT translation today. And uh, just kind of hold your place there. Let me welcome our online campus. It's great to have you with us if you can't be here in person. Philippians chapter 1, and just for a little context, Paul is in chains. Not good. Paul is in jail. He is in chains, like chained to Roman soldiers. And he is having every reason to be bitter here, every reason to be fatigued, every reason to give up and say, I'm done. This mountain of adversity is beating me. And I, I cash out. And he had every reason to. None of us would fault him. There is wave after wave of bad news. But he maintains his focus not only on Christ, but on his church. As he attempts to pastor these people from a jail. And he starts saying words like, I'm convinced. I give thanks. I have eager hope. I am certain of this. I never grow tired. I love you. I pray for you. I am grateful for you. And he's got this incredible mindset. And then he goes on to say how he deals with adversity, with steadfastness that we can emulate. So with that as our background, look now at verse 12. And he says, and I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has been awful. He doesn't say that. Everything here, let me go through my list of sorrows, and he doesn't say that. Everything here has helped me to spread the good news. That's incredible. And that's our first truth. Adversity can promote the progress of the gospel. Paul shows us that. It is a powerful truth. Don't miss this. This is, when, this is what impresses me. Notice right off the block what he doesn't do. He doesn't talk about his discomfort. Paul doesn't go through his list of things that he has reason to be upset about, his trials, all the adversity he's going through. Notice what he, he talks about how his imprisonment is advancing the gospel. It's the furtherance of the gospel. The Greek word used there, by the way, is indicating a group of engineers preparing a road so the army can come in advance. It literally means, I'm going ahead of you. I'm going to prepare the road. I'm removing obstacles, trees, debris, rocks, so the army tanks can come. That's the inference right here. That is so incredible. Paul's circumstances had actually removed barriers for the advancement of the gospel. He's in the seat of power. He's in Rome. He's with Caesar. This is incredible. This couldn't have worked out any better, and he got it. He was so mature that he didn't look at his problems. He looked at what God could do through them. Do we? Man, that's, that's bold. Look at verse 13. He goes on. He says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Boom. Unashamedly, unapologetically. He just says, whole palace guard knows why I'm here. I'm here because of Jesus. And the truth for us is adversity provides those opportunities to witness. And it is powerful. He got it. Think about this. In Paul's day, guards were assigned to prisoners. They were chained to them. They had to keep them safe because they were awaiting a hearing in front of the emperor, Emperor Caesar himself. And these were not just little, like, day guards. Like, here's, here's minimum wage. Can you kind of sit with this guy? These were the elite imperial praetorian guards. I see it in your eyes. Some of you are thinking it. You, it's the minute I hear imperial guards, I think this right away. Anyone else with me? Is that it? Yes, I see that hand. Amen. This is right. These are the guards. These are the best of the best designed to guard the emperor 
In Paul's case, it was Caesar. Or maybe you're in the new thing, you kind of like this right here, you want to look at Snoke. Here's Snoke in the, the new series. If you look closely, here's the Apostle Paul. He's being held over here in the corner. And the imperial guards are designed not only to protect the emperor, but to protect those prisoners. And they are chained to them. I mean, it is a deep, deep thing to get into this kind of seat of power. Let me show you what I mean. Paul is being chained to a Roman guard. Before he's committed to house arrest, they have a guard stationed with him 24-7, chained to him four shifts a day, 24 hours a day, for, for two to three years. Some estimates say that was 3,000 opportunities to share the gospel. You want to talk about a literal captive audience? Those guards couldn't get away. They're chained to them. I mean, this is truly a captive audience. Like, hey, where are we going? Guess what? Let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Somebody please relieve me. Let somebody have this next shift and walk with Paul. And he was so bold. These chains furthered the gospel. And it was a beautiful thing. Think about this. Paul had a, a, a captive audience. It got so good. By the end of Philippians, if you forward to, to chapter 4, read it when you get home. Paul is actually seen signing off his letter, closing out the book by saying this, all the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. Yeah, two people got that. Okay, let me explain what that means. He's in Caesar's household. He is under Roman guard. He is literally with the people. He is in emperor's inner circle, his own household, and now they have such a love for Paul such an affinity for Paul. He has converted so many of these people that they are actually saying, hey, Paul, what you doing? He's like, writing, I'm writing my letter to the Philippian church. What's up? It's like, hey, I can just see these guards over here. They've, they've taken the cuffs off because they trust him. And they're like, hey, we're going to play some poker over here. And wh what you doing? I'm writing a letter. Oh, yeah, hey, tell them we said hello. Give them our greetings. Does that paint a picture for you? Tell them we said hello. This is the emperor's guards. This is incredible. They are, they, are, they are turning Paul's adversity into the furtherance of the gospel. Do we do that? Is that how we view? No, man, we view struggles. Hate them. It's the worst day ever. Have a good day. Don't you tell me what kind of day to have. I'll have a good day. I'm gonna have, oh, you said good day. Okay, I'll have a good day. I mean, this is, this is beautiful. You want a, mo a more modern example? Look no farther than the great German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Oh. This is a man's man. A German pastor who had the guts to stand up to his wicked Nazi dictator, proudly opposing Hitler himself and his genocide and all of his wickedness. So much so that his own people arrested him and threw him in prison for a year and a half. And then you think, okay, he served his time. No, no, no. Guess what? He gets downgraded and thrown into a concentration camp. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a famous German theologian, he went on to write The Cost of Discipleship, a modern classic. And they were saying when they locked him up, prisoners would move him from cell to cell and keep him moving. And if he had to take a trip somewhere to, to the latrine or different things, it was overheard. He had impacted so many people for Christ that the soldiers would whisper, I'm so sorry, as they locked him back up. It got so bad, I should say, it got so good. Soldiers were overheard saying, I apologize to you. Why are we doing this? You've changed my life. I wish I could set you free, but I can't. That is because adversity led to the furtherance of the gospel. And he went on to be executed in that concentration camp for his faith. Wow. Man, that is deep stuff. Adversity provides an opportunity to witness. It didn't stop there. Look at verse 14. Paul goes on to say, because of my imprisonment, because of these chains, most of the believers here have gained confidence now, and they boldly speak God's message without fear. That is awesome. The next truth we see here, adversity produces courage in you and I, and fellow believers, and like-minded believers. It is amazing. So many believers became bold because they saw Paul's courage. Why? Because courage is contagious. It is incredible. Even the great Billy Graham, he put it this way. I love this. He says, courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. Mm. When somebody stands up and does the right thing, and there's a few people on the fence waving, they see that. And they say, yeah, we're with him. We're going to stand against this. How about you? How about you?
about me. Man, that's boldness. When it's not popular to stand for Christ at the office, because everybody laughs at your archaic Bronze Age religion. Students, when you're at school, it's easy to laugh at those jokes that everyone else is laughing. You know it's not right. Or you want to invite them to that next event. You're like, oh my goodness, this would be so perfect. You need Jesus. I can't say anything. Maybe you're the one that needs to stand up and that spine is stiffened of those other people. And you see people come out of the closet going, yeah, I'm with you too. I'm with you too. I'll take a stand for Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer did that to his death. Paul is amazing. He gives us this beautiful example. I got to go look on verse 15. I love this. He goes on to say, it's true that some are preaching now out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach out of Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Verse 17, those others, they don't have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to hurt me, to make my chains more painful. Remember that. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. I'll say it again. I will rejoice. Adversity reveals your character. It reveals the character of other people, and it reveals the character of ourselves. This is so, this is a hidden gem, church. Don't miss this. If you've read this a hundred times, you might have missed this, because I did. I love this. Notice that Paul never calls them false teachers. Did you catch that? He, he, this is so amazing to me. He never says it. Look, he says they preach Christ. He freely says they're preaching Christ. They're doing it have horrible motives. But notice, notice his, his response. I love this. He, they did it out of jealousy and selfish ambition, but Paul says, I don't care. I don't care about their motives. No matter how much they tried to hurt Paul, Paul's goal never changed. It was to see the gospel go out. How about you? It's said, it's amazing what one can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. That's a beautiful thing. Paul said, I don't care. My job is to see the gospel go forth. The word gospel used here is a beautiful word called euangelion. Euangelion. In fact, say it with me. Euangelion. Isn't that great? It makes me think of a jelly donut. Euangelion. The universal good news, God's saving grace through faith in Christ. That's what it means. He's saying, this is why I live. Even in horrible adversity, when people are coming against him and it's unpleasant and people are trying to hurt him, Paul's goal was to see the gospel presented in any manner that advanced it. And this revealed his character. And it reveals our character when adversity comes. Because let's be honest, life happens. And it has a way of revealing what's underneath. It has a way of showing what we're made of. Some of you may have seen this going around social media. I love this. It's perfectly timed. Imagine I have this giant mug full of coffee, and someone comes up to me and bumps my arm, and I spill some. I spill some coffee. Now, why did that happen? Our natural answer is to say, because somebody bumped you. Wrong answer. The reason I spilled coffee is because there is coffee in this mug. There's coffee in this cup. If I had been drinking tea that day and somebody bumped me, I would have spilled tea. Because what's inside this is what will spill out. Oh, you, get, oh, you got it. See what matters? What's inside, whatever is inside us is what will happen to come out. Life happens. It, somebody will come and bump you. It, count it. It will probably happen before you leave the church parking lot. Somebody will come and there will be something said or done where you, you have a chance to react. And what's inside us is what will reveal itself. What's inside? Is it bitterness? Is it quick temper, short fuse? Is it, is it anger? Or is it peace? Is it love? Is it joy? Because what's inside us is what will come out. Adversity reveals our character. How's your character? Let me challenge you, man. 2018, take it up a notch. The person who you are when no one's looking. Does it walk after Christ? Does your heart beat for him first and then all these other trifles? And that's my challenge. Read on in verse 19. I love this. He says, for I know that as you pray for me and the spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and I hope, look at this hopeful language he's using, that I will never be ashamed but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. 
And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. Wow. And that's our next truth grenade for us. Adversity brings maturity and growth in our lives. And it is powerful. When this happens, you have a chance to embrace it or reject it. When God is trying to refine us, Paul is so aware of how God works through prayers, the people, through, through the influence of the Spirit of Christ in them, and he gives us incredible eagerness and determination to follow him despite his environment. Paul has eager expectation and hope. Do we? When adversity comes our way, do we maintain that attitude of eager expectation, or do we crumple under the weight? Do we fold like a cheap $20 suit from Goodwill? Boom. What do we do with that? The Greek word here, when he says eager expectation, conveys, don't miss this, conveys the idea of someone watching for something so intently that your head will turn wherever it goes, that you will tune out all the distractions, like you have blinders. I watch with eager expectation, looking, and I will not be moved. I have incredible focus, eager expectation. 150 years ago, there was a great hero of the faith, George Washington Carver. He overcame adversity. He rose from the depths of slavery through adversity, through poverty, to become the most distinguished professor in the history of Iowa State A&M. This guy, his scientific breakthroughs in botany and agriculture and peanut farming and all these things we take for granted today came from him. His intellect was so vast, so, so uh, coveted that people, famous people, would seek him the world over. People like Henry Ford would seek him out and say, man, how are you doing this? Can you come help me out? People like John Kellogg's, who did all the Kellogg cereals. Even Mahatma Gandhi would write letters asking for his wisdom and his advice. Even Thomas Edison sought him out. Now remember this. This is over 100 years ago. Offered him a six-figure salary if he would just come and work with him and show him some of his genius. He turned it down. That would have been over a million dollars today. A year. He turned it down. Why? Because fame and money and self-important titles meant nothing to him. This was a man who loved Jesus, and it showed. In fact, if you Google him, this is the quote that will come up. The secret of my success? It's simple. <laughs> it's found in the Bible. This was a man who knew adversity. In fact, President Roosevelt would later seek him out and ask him for wisdom. One day, he goes to his mailbox, and he opens a letter from Booker T. Washington from the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Amen. Roll tide. God bless, God bless America. He's, he's opening this letter, and the great Booker T. Washington writes this. Our students here at the Tuskegee Institute are poor. They're often starving. They travel miles of torn roads across years of poverty. We can teach them to read and to write, but we simply cannot fill their empty stomachs with words. Will you please come? They need to be taught how to feed themselves, how to plant, how to harvest, how to grow their own crops, start their own businesses. And Washington went on to beg and plead, would you please come to Tuskegee? Would you please come? Please come and teach. Knowing against hope, there's not a chance. He says, listen, I got to be straight with you. I cannot offer you money. I can't offer you position. I can't offer you fame. In fact, all I can offer you is a lot of hard, hard work. To the shock of his colleagues, Carver accepted the invitation. And he wrote back this beautiful sentence. I'm looking forward to joining you for a very pleasant, busy, profitable time at your college. And I will be glad to cooperate with you in doing all I can through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. This is a man who is not afraid to overcome adversity. When things hit him left and right, he overcame it because he knew God had a far greater purpose. Adversity brings maturity and growth. Paul saw that. Paul was eager, and he had expectation and hope that never wavers. In fact, he brings it all down to this next verse. He says this in verse 21. For to me, living is for Christ, and dying, that's even better. To live is Christ. To die, <laughs> that's gain. That, just take it to the next level. Adversity purifies our motives. It's why we do what we do. When adversity comes, remember last week we saw Paul's focus how he pressed on towards the goal, this one thing that drove him. Now we see his single life purpose summed up in one verse, to live as Christ, to die as gain. In fact, most scholars will tell you this is the core verse of all of Philippians, possibly of all of Paul's ministry, because it reveals his mission and his motive in just a few words. 
to live is for Christ. I'm happy to do it, but boy, I just, I just, it summarizes his whole thing. And then he goes on to explain it. Look at verse 22. He says, you see, if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know what's better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, I think it's better I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm convinced I'm going to remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you'll have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because what he's doing through me. And this is what it's all driving towards, how adversity makes us prepare to see life with the proper perspective. Death, life, all of it, everything is summed up in how we focus on living for the Lord. This is so powerful. Paul is a man who gets it. When he comes out and he ushers a statement, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he goes on to explain what he's really wrestling with. Think about this, church. He is doing this. He's opening his heart. He's saying, I'm going to share with you the struggle. Here's what I really feel. I'm just going to share with you this. I am torn between my true heart and what I think God wants me to do. Here's my desire, and here's my duty. And then Paul says, whatever you want, God, whatever you want. Think about this. Paul is torn. It's like Paul saying, Lord, it's just me and you. I finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I've completed it. I'm tired. Can I come home now? Can I come home now? I've been beaten. I've had more stripes on my back. I've been shipwrecked. I've been jailed. I've been starving. I've been free. I've been through it all. I'm kind of done. <laughs> Can I come home now? Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. If you want me to stay, if you want me to shepherd your people a little longer. You see, for Paul, life means pouring it out for more people, means serving others and blessing people and loving the Lord and helping people come to know Christ. But death offers him the blessing of finally and completely knowing the Savior. To Paul, this is the ultimate win-win. And he gets it. He was perfectly willing to do whatever the Lord asked him to do. Are we? That's inspiring. I love it. Let's pray about it. God, I thank you for your challenge. I thank you that you sift through all the clutter and point to the core of our heart. You say, I don't want that, I don't want that, I want this. And Lord, we are faced with the task today to say, do we surrender all? Do we truly give you lordship? True owner rights to every aspect of our being. God, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Paul and the saints gone before and George Washington Carver and all these heroes we look up to, God, help us to emulate their example and to say, Lord, we, we give it to you. When the bad times come, we stand for you. In the good times, we stand for you. And everywhere in between, God, help us be faithful. May we shine for you in a world of darkness. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.